Hi, good evening. My name is James Michael Bowers, and I am the Northeast Lincoln City Council representative, and this is our Northeast Town Hall meeting. These meetings started from the very first Northeast Lincoln City Council representative, and it's important that we continue these. This is our second time holding this meeting virtually, and you can tune in through YouTube, Facebook Live, the city's website, and some public access channels uh, through your cable. Uh, how these meetings usually break down is I usually give a quick update on some things that the council has been working on over the past month, and then I bring in a guest speaker to talk about a topic that is relevant to either the city or Northeast Lincoln in particular. Uh, today we have Director Elliott with Lincoln Transportation Utilities, and she's going to talk a little bit about some changes that will be coming up with school zones in Lincoln. And I'll invite her up in a little bit, but there's a couple things that I want to uh, update, update Northeast Lincoln on. Uh, this past week, um, the Railroad Transportation Safety District, which I'm a vice president of, voted to make September 21st to September 27th U.S. Rail Week, U.S. Rail Safety Week. Uh, in 2019, 24 Nebraskans were killed or injured in vehicle train collisions, and another 15 Nebraskans were killed or injured while walking on or around ra railroad tracks. So we're partnering with Operation Lifesaver, which is an organization dedicated to public safety education and awareness uh, regarding uh, collisions, fatalities, and injuries on railroad tracks. And so in an effort to increase public safety in, on railroad tracks and on crossings throughout the city of Lincoln and Lancaster County, September 21st through September 27th will be U.S. Rail Safety Week. And I would also like to thank our governor who signed a similar resolution that will happen statewide at the same time. An issue that you might have heard about recently in the news um, that I was actually in uh, the minority of was uh, a ordinance that we voted on to ban signs in the council chambers. And so this was an issue that I did not vote with my other colleagues on uh, because I felt pretty strongly uh, that this was not right for uh, Lincoln and this was not right for uh, citizens who wanted to come and uh, get their voice heard. Essentially what this ban was, was to ban signs inside the council chambers. And the effort of this was to maintain decorum during meetings uh, and to make sure that there wasn't any kind of distractions happening in the audience. This has been a relatively recent issue that has popped up and we already had rules in place that allowed the council to maintain decorum. And especially as we are in these divided times, getting signs and having their sign, people having signs out was one way for people to express, them spell, exp to express themselves. And one thing that I'm consistently hearing from people in Lincoln, if I'm being completely honest, is that they feel like that their elected officials and their government isn't listening to them. And so I did not feel comfortable voting on an action item that would further restrict a person's ability to express themselves to their elected officials. The ban did pass, uh, but I did vote against it, and I'd be happy to answer any questions on my reasoning on why I voted against it, uh, but please feel free to email me, and my email is jbowers at lincoln.ne.gov. Another thing I want to update people on is uh, give a little uh, health update. Um, I want to encourage people to get a flu shot, and I'm going to name off some dates and times where people can go get a flu shot. Uh, on, and you do not need an appointment to go to these drive-through flu shot sites, but they do recommend it. So I'll provide a list of the dates and times and the addresses, and then I'll provide the list, the link to where you can sign up. October 2nd from 8 a.m. to 12, and also October 15th from 1 to 4 at Southwest Family Health at 1240 Aries Drive. October 3rd, October 17th, October 24th, from 8 to 12 at Family Health Physicians at 4501 South 70th, Suite 140. And then October 8th, from 9 to noon at Autumn Ridge at 5000 North 26th, Suite 100. So these are available for individuals 7 and up. And again, you don't need an appointment to go get a flu shot, but they do encourage it. And you can sign up for an appointment at chihealth.com forward slash flu. That address again is chihealth.com forward slash flu. 
And again, it's more important than ever that we get our flu shots and that we make sure that we are keeping ourselves healthy and that we're keeping people around us healthy also. also. Another health-related update is the council recently voted uh, to uh, have uh, to partner with Brian, and Brian will be putting in a new cancer clinic, cancer, cancer hospital, over in, in Lincoln, more on the south side of town. Originally, I had some concerns about this, but my concerns were more based on location. As we know, North Lincoln uh, does have lower health outcomes uh, than other parts of the city. And what I mean by lower health outcomes, I mean life expectancy, obesity, and access to health care. And so I really wanted to encourage our partners and community, uh, community partners uh, to continue to focus on the north side of town. But this cancer center will provide a needed benefit in our city and also can be a resource for those in our state. When I spoke with Bryan Hospital, they provided an update on some things that they've provided in the north side of town. The Bryan North, north Point Clinic opened in the summer of 2018 with seven providers. In July of 2020, they have exp expanded and added a Bryan Urgent Care at the North Point Clinic. And in 2019, they secured land at 84th and Adams for future primary care growth. But this isn't, this isn't the end of it. We need to make sure that we are continuing to look at health disparities and what we can do to make sure that North and Northeast Lincoln has the access to healthcare and the health outcomes as any other part in the city because your zip code should not matter uh, in when it comes to your health and how you live. So I look forward to partnering with other organizations like Brian as Brian continues their 2023 strategic plan and as they complete their community health needs assessment that's completed every three years. Brian has been a great partner for Lincoln and I look forward to seeing the great work that they're going to do in our city. Another update I'd like to provide is we've had uh, some cars that have been broken into and cars that have been stolen that have been unlocked with their keys and their ignition. So I, I would ask that everyone in Northeast Lincoln follows LPD's advice, Lincoln Police Department's advice, and do not leave your car unlocked and do not leave your keys in the car when you start it up, maybe just to warm up your car, maybe because it's easier just to put the keys in there and you forgot something, you got to run back inside, but that leaves your car at risk to be stolen or to have something stolen out of your car. So it's important that we follow LPD's advice so that way we don't have any property stolen and that way we're not taking up LPD's time. Another thing the council voted on last week was uh, a resolution honoring Investigator Herrera and his 23 years of service to our community. We wanted to give him the highest honor possible and a formal recognition from the city council thanking him and his family for their service and their sacrifice in keeping Lincoln safe. It's been a hard month for LPD. It's been a hard month for uh, Investigator Herrera's family, and I would ask that we continue to keep them in our thoughts uh, and in our prayers. There's still a GoFundMe link available for those who would like to donate to the family directly, and you can find that through the Lincoln Police Department's uh, Facebook site. Our uh, Nebraska Community Blood Bank is still in need of blood, so if you are able, please consider donating blood and I'll be back later uh, this evening before we wrap up uh, to talk about a spaghetti feed um, that will be occurring later this month uh, to help support Investigator Herrera's family. So on that note, I would like to invite Director Elliot up um, with Lincoln Transportation Utilities, uh, and she will have some information for us about school zones and increasing safety in Lincoln. Thank you, Councilman Bowers, and thank you for letting us uh, visit with all of you here this evening. The safety of those in our community is Lincoln Transportation and Utilities' top priority. And one area of special interest to our traffic team is those school zones throughout our community. Um, contrary to what many people think, uh, there's a lot of studies um, and a lot of research and time that goes into developing what should be a, uh, a school zone, how those school zones should be marked, 
and what is the safest way to get children to and from our schools across the community. A while back, our traffic engineer uh, under worked with some consultants and undertook a, a study to determine what would be the best approach for school zones here in Lincoln. After a lot of research, assessments here in the community, that final report has finally been concluded and has presented some new recommendations on steps that the Lincoln Transportation and Utilities team should take to improve our school zones and make them safer for children and all pedestrians. Uh, here to talk a little bit more is the true expert for this, and that is our traffic engineer, Mark Lujaharms, and Melissa Lam Ramos Lamley. Um, and they will talk a little bit more about what went into this study, what were some of the aspects that were considered, and what will be some of the changes that you will see. One of the biggest changes that you will notice will be a change in the speed zones around certain school areas. Um, so they'll also talk about how long this will take. This is not going to be a project that happens overnight. Uh, we have a number of schools uh, across the city, and unfortunately we're not able to just make all of the changes uh, all at once. So it will be a gradual progress that we will keep you updated on. So without further ado, to get to the, the interesting part and the, the information that we really want, I will turn it over to Mark and Melissa. Thank you. Well, thank you, Director Elliott, and thank you, Councilman Bowers, for inviting us here this evening. Uh, hopefully, the remainder of my slides don't represent the technical difficulties that we're showing on this first one. Uh, a little bit, there appears to be some incompatibility between the versions of software that were used to create this and display this. So, uh, hopefully, that'll uh, be corrected uh, in sub subsequent slides. Uh, we do have a, a presentation that's a little more than 20 minutes, so uh, bear with us. But hopefully, it's some some good information. Um, as Director Elliott said, we'll. Uh, enhance safety associated with our schools uh, across uh, Lincoln. Uh, so our agenda for our presentation is as follows. Uh, I'm going to provide some background and process for how we got to where we are today. And then I'll uh, summarize the standards themselves that have been developed as part of this uh, school zone study process. And then Melissa will uh, partner with me to discuss the implementation plan for how we'll roll these standards out to all of the schools in Lincoln. So the purpose of this uh, entire effort was to enhance safety around schools and along walking routes associated with those schools, while also developing some consistency of traffic control devices such that motorists have a better idea of what to expect when they're entering a given school zone or traveling around the school between different school zones. This effort was uh, completed in partnership with a nationally recognized consultant in the areas of act active transportation um, and built upon best practices in the area of pedestrian mobility and safe routes to schools. And then finally, the process was also executed alongside a citizen panel who provided input and feedback uh, to the development of these standards. So as we're, we're putting together these standards, it was important for us to identify uh, what exactly qualifies as a school and within Lincoln Municipal Code in the chapter and section shown there on the screen, um, this defines uh, what a school is and what would be eligible, if you will, for um, implementation of these standards in and around those schools. And so, again, a school shall mean a public, private, denominational, or parochial school which meets the requirements for accreditation of approval prescribed by the Nebraska State of Nebraska pursuant to Nebraska Revised Statute Chapter 79 and which has or includes any or all grades kindergarten through 12th grade. And what this results in, I think we have roughly 85 schools across Lincoln in which would meet this definition of a school and which over the next several years we would apply these school, school zone standards to. Regarding the standards themselves, uh, they're simply boiled down into these three categories. Uh, the first being the definition and designation of a school zone and identifying specific traffic control devices or signs, signals, traffic markings that inform motorists when they are in a school zone. Second, uh, reduce speed zones within the school zones themselves. 
And then thirdly, establish criteria for crosswalk treatments along school walking routes and a process for determining what those should be along those school routes. So first, the school zone. Uh, for the purposes of these recommendations, the school zone is identified as the school property boundary plus all streets and intersections immediately adjacent to the school property. For the hypothetical school shown on the image that you're seeing on the screen, the school zone is highlighted in green. So again, the school zone is the school property and all streets and intersections immediately adjacent to the school property. Then within a school zone, motorists and pedestrians will be presented with unique signage that will only be found in school zones. In an order from left to right on your screen, and in most cases, the order in which motorists would see the signs as they enter a school zone and approach the school are as follows. So the school zone sign, which is the furthest sign on your left, uh, this sign alerts users of the street that they are approaching a school and where additional care is needed to ensure the safety for all users. A school zone sign should be installed at all school zones to identify the area at a school zone and to, identi to identify the area as a school zone, excuse me, and to identify a school crossing locations. The second sign that you see on the screen is the reduce speed limit signage. And then the third set of signs, the, the third and the fourth signs there on the right, are school crossing signs in advance of and at marked crosswalks within the school zone itself. So the second general area of standards uh, developed through this process is reduced speed zones. Uh, the reduce, uh, excuse me, the purpose of reduced speed zones is predicated on the fact that higher speeds are associated with a greater likelihood of severe injuries or in some cases fatalities in the event of a crash between a vehicle and a pedestrian. And for a number of reasons, slow speeds in school zones are critical for the safety of all users. And so as such, in most cases, we will be reducing the speed limit within reduced speed zones from the current 25 miles an hour that you see in, current, in speed zones today to 20 miles per hour. An additional change is that in order to achieve greater conformity and to optimize safety along the streets in which reduced speeds are established, reduced speed zones should be reserved for implementation only on streets, but all streets, that are within the designated school zone. And again, as mentioned before, or defined before, that would be all the streets and intersections immediately adjacent to the school property. So some specific examples of how we would um, inform motorists of these reduced uh, speed limits associated with school zones um, are as follows. Um, first of all, for streets that have a base posted speed limit of 25 miles an hour, and that is typically local streets or streets within residential neighborhoods, the reduced speed zone would be indicated with a plaque underneath the speed limits, underneath the school zone sign, or the speed limit sign, excuse me, saying that the reduced speed would be in effect when, ch when children are present. On streets adjacent to the school property that have a base posted speed limit of 30 or 35 miles an hour, the reduced speed zone would be indicated with flashing beacons, similar to today, indicating the time of the reduced speed limit. And typically, in most all cases, that is 30 minutes before the start of school, and 30 minutes after the uh, last uh, bell of the school day. These would typically be along collector streets and in some cases minor arterial streets. Unfortunately, just a few locations, uh, there are schools that are located um, immediately adjacent to arterial streets with a base posted speed limit of 40 miles per hour or higher. In these cases, because of national criteria on how we reduce speed limits incrementally, uh, an, an engineering study should be conducted to evaluate appropriate measures for potential reductions either to the base posted speed limit or other measures on how to reduce the speed limits before and after school. And those will be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis, taking into consideration the various characteristics associated with that school and the surrounding um, area, including uh, the streets itself. The third general category, and um, the final one that we'll mention in our standards, um, is crosswalk treatments along school walking routes. Again, for definition purposes, a school crosswalk would be considered to be any crosswalk within a school zone or on a school's primary walking route. And we'll talk about those uh, primary walking routes later on in our presentation. 
Uh, the purpose of the primary walking route network is to identify the routes to the school in which serve the greatest number of students and where school crosswalk treatments should be installed. The four types of crossings are summarized on the screen and include both signalized and unsignalized crossings. Uh, the recommended uh, crossing treatments summarized within the school zone standards document were included with the purpose of enhancing the safety of children walking to and from school with the design principles listed on the screen. And each of the recommended crossing treatments that were identified for inclusion or for consideration along our school walking routes were identified to address one or more of these design principles shown. Determining the recommended crossing treatments by crossing type is guided by information illustrated on the following four slides. Uh, there's a lot of detail in these slides, so I'm not gonna get into them in great detail, but if you are interested, we will sh uh, share with you a, a website uh, in which the details of the study and these uh, crossing treatments can be um, found. So first, uh, signalize intersections. Uh, that would be the first crossing cro crosswalk treatment type. And for each of these four different types of crosswalk treatments, uh, they're, they're categorized into three different categories or tiers. One being standard crossing treatments, and these would be treatments that would be required at all crosswalks within these certain types. And then two other categories that are treatments for consideration and other treatments that could be used if the standard treatments weren't achieving the desired result or if there were unique uh, circumstances or characteristics about certain crossings in which uh, treatments be up above and beyond the standard treatment were not uh, sufficient. The second general uh, type of crossing are at stop controlled approach crossings. So that would be at locations that have stop signs uh, controlling the vehicular traffic before crossing the crosswalk. The third being at signalized mid block crossings. These are crossings where it's just a signal for the pedestrians only in which pedestrians come up to the crossing press a push button, wait for the vehicular traffic to be stopped by uh, the red traffic indication, and then allowing pedestrians to cross with a walk signal indication. And then the fourth type would be uncontrolled crossings. These are simply uh, more minor intersections, usually in neighborhood areas, in which there is not either yield signs or stop signs controlling the approach to motorists before they cross the crosswalk. So with that, I'm going to have uh, Melissa come up and uh, chat with you for a little bit to talk through the details of our implementation plan, and then I'll return with some final comments. Thanks, Mark. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what it looks like when we apply these standards to a school. Um, I'll be using Human Elementary, located in the Cripple Creek neighborhood, as an example. Um, first, we identify the school zone, which is displayed on the map in pink. And as Mark described before, this is the school um, property boundary plus all streets and intersections adjacent to the school. We then apply the school signage, which includes the school zone sign, the reduced speed signs, and end of school zone sign. Any existing crossing locations and traffic control devices in the area are added to the map. Um, if the school has an established traffic plan, which is shown on the map there in purple, that's drawn in. And all of that information allows us to have a clear picture of the existing conditions around the school. We then move on to establishing the primary walking routes. We create a circle with a half mile radius around the school property. And this represents the potential school walk zone. The red dots shown on the map are the students that attend this school. Um, we're looking to identify the routes which is going to serve the greatest number of those students and where crosswalk treatment should be installed. Here we've identified the shortest route to school for each of the 283 students living within the potential walk zone. The lines displayed there are color coded based on how many students are on that particular segment. Transportation staff analyze this information taking into consideration not only where the students are currently living, but where they're likely to live in the future. And the goal is to establish a route that's going to serve the students and the school for a number of years to come. Once the walking route has been established, all of the possible crossing locations are identified and placed into a database 
to determine the appropriate treatments to apply. Oh, excuse me, I clipped something. There we go. Um, the recommendations are based on the type of traffic control present, the posted speed limit, the number of lanes being crossed, and traffic volumes. This map shows our final recommendation for human elementary. We've not only identified which locations meet the criteria for crossing treatments, but some that should be removed because they don't um, satisfy our standards. There we go. Okay, and then all of this information is then put together into a memo for the affected school. This document provides background information on the school zone study and explains our proposed changes. Our intention is to open communication with the school and allow them to have an opportunity to provide comments and feedback. And we also want them to have this information in a format that's easily shareable with their parents and students. All right, great job, Melissa. Uh, just a, a few final remarks. Uh, in regards to implementation plan, uh, this is going to take us a while to accomplish. I think the number of schools that we show on the slide is actually um, slightly larger than that once we identified a couple of additional schools that meet that school definition. Nonetheless, we have uh, several schools uh, and it's going to take significant funding to, to implement these standards at all of the schools. And so in short, uh, it's going to be a multi-phase, multi-year approach to get these standards uh, implemented at all of our schools across the city. Uh, coordination is going to be key in doing this uh, throughout these next several years in doing so successfully and efficiently. Uh, so we'll want to continue to coordinate with the individual schools, giving them opportunity to provide us feedback to what we propose to implement, but also to provide opportunity uh, for coordination with other projects that are going on within various city departments so that we take advantage of efficiencies and other projects that are taking place to incorporate these standards. Uh, we're also going to start simple. Uh, there may be some adjustments or things that we learn along the way as we implement these at, at some initial schools and so we want to make sure that we give ourselves some opportunity to, to make some adjustments along the way. I uh, also want to make sure that we, we make sure that uh, the community is, is uh, confident that what we're implementing um, is producing safety benefits to the school children and other pedestrians that enter around the schools. Um, I say this because in addition to adding some of the various uh, components and treatments that we talked about in our uh, presentation this evening, there will also be instances where we'll be removing some existing traffic control devices, and we know that that will take some explanation um, to the community as we make those changes. And finally, uh, we are funding some opportunities for uh, identifying some opportunities for funding outside of our typical resources. Uh, we're currently in conversations with the Nebraska Department of Transportation, who has some systemic uh, funding for programs just like this and we have some level of confidence that we'll be successful in achieving those but we'll continue those conversations. So with that, uh, that concludes our presentation about our school zone standards. I'm sure there's some other things that you're curious about if you are interested. Uh, both Melissa's and my contact information are shown on the screen but perhaps more importantly you should visit traffic.lincoln.ne.gov that contains all of the standards that we discussed this evening in many more details. So again, traffic.lincoln.ne.gov. Thanks for your time this evening. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you so much, uh, Director Elliot. And thank you so much, uh, Mark, for coming out and uh, providing us with this information and also a route for uh, folks to ask questions um, if they uh, have some concerns or if they want more information. Um, these Northeast Town Hall meetings will be on the third Thursday of the month from 5.30 to 6.30. Next month will also be virtual and we can tune in through YouTube, Facebook, uh, and then also some public access channels uh, that will be listed online. If you have any future ideas for topics that you would like to see covered in the Northeast uh, Town Hall meetings, please feel free to email me anytime. And my email is jbowers at lincoln.ne.gov. Before I let you go for the night, I want to just follow up on when the spaghetti feed is to help support Investigator Herrera. Uh, the spaghetti feed will be September 24th from 4 to 8 at Sheridan Lutheran Church, 
at 6955 Old Cheney Road. And that's $10 per meal. And then you get a to-go container that includes spaghetti, meatballs, breadsticks, and a cookie. And I hope to see you all there on September 24th. I'd like to thank again our guests for coming out, and I can't wait to see you next month um, as we uh, talk about some more issues that impact Northeast Lincoln. My name again is James Michael Bowers, and this is the Northeast Town Hall Meeting. Thank you.